Hello, everyone. Welcome to Toronto Geometry Colloquium. This is a weekly web series all about geometry processing. This colloquium aims at promoting young researchers and researchers from traditionally underrepresented communities. Every week, we'll have an opener talking about their cutting edge research for 10 minutes, followed by a headliner giving us a keynote presentation. Hello, everybody. Welcome to yet another episode of TGC. I'm very excited for the session we have today. Um, our first opening speaker is from our very own lab here at the DGP. We're very excited to have him on, and he's one of the most helpful people involved in our lab. He's one of the first people I ask for whenever I need or have a question about an optimization technique. Um, his work deals with one of the most challenging, in my opinion, problems in graphics. How, how can you tell how close two objects are to each other? Um, this is a super important question in many fields, especially if you're wondering whether or not these whether or not two objects intersect. Think of any sort of robotics or self-driving cars, contacts and collision simulations. Um, this is something that might sound simple conceptually, uh, but if you really think about it, you'll realize it's hard to come up with a solution that runs quickly, gives good results, and doesn't use up a ton of memory. Fortunately, this is exactly what his most recent work, which will be presented at SIGGRAPH this summer, is about. Please welcome Abhishek Medan. Thank you for the really nice introduction, Otman. Um, so let me start sharing my screen just a second. Um, yeah, can you see everything? Okay, great. Well, I'll get started now. So uh, hi, everyone. Uh, today I'll be talking about fast evaluation of smooth distance constraints on co-dimensional geometry. This is a joint work with my supervisor, Dave Levine, at the University of Toronto. So um, in typical contact simulation algorithms, we'll have like some solids, like these two bunnies that we're going to collide with each other and interact. And then they're also going to interact with some environment. So um, the way this works is it's typically done through distance constraints where we formulate the uh, physics of the problem and an optimization problem. And we have a uh, pairwise uh, distance constraint between each like pair of objects. So then we, we say that each one should have these like some a positive distance away from each other. The minimum distance should be uh, uh, positive. So while this is straightforward for solids, we have to be a little careful for other types of geometry. So here we have some edges. We have this edge bowl and this edge ball. And we, and we need to be careful to make sure that they don't uh, pass through, that, that the edges don't pass through each other. So for example, we want to drop and roll around like this. And even more difficult, um, we also have um, points. So here the surface isn't even well-defined, so, but we also want to make sure that we can uh, run simulation algorithms on them uh, in some you know reasonable way like this. So we can drop this bunny onto this lighter terrain and it can bounce around. And um, so the goal today is, is to figure out how we can simulate contact for the sort of co-dimensional geometry like points and edges where it doesn't immediately represent a solid. We know it does because it is it is representing a solid, but at least in the format it's stored in, it's not immediately clear how it represents that. And this is becoming more important because we have uh, many different sources of like acquiring geometry that will be given in some co-dimensional form. So for example, uh, through self-driving cars, we have lots of LiDAR scans of streets. And even at a consumer level with new I iPads and iPhones, we um, can also acquire uh, point cloud scans of you know, our desks or rooms and so on. And so um, the first approach we, we could take to try and you know convert this co-dimensional format to new use, or rather, First way we can try and simulate this is just convert it to another format. So here I opened this point cloud in MeshLab, I computed normals, and then I applied Poisson surface reconstruction. But as you can see, it's it's really quite tricky to do because at least just with the default settings, I get what I what you see on the right, where all those houses along the street turn into blobs. Um, the power lines are kind of inconsistent. And a lot of detail in the cars is gone. So it takes a lot of memory to really reconstruct that fine detail. Another alternative is to take this geometry and represent it with some sort of implicit function. So the easiest thing we can do, which represents the constraint we really want, is to uh, compute the exact minimum distance to our data, and then just take some offset to make sure that it doesn't have any holes in it and we have some closed surface. But if we take too big an offset, we'll get this problem that we see on the left, where a lot of these outlier points become sort of inflated. And this is especially a big problem for LiDAR, where these, these sort of points are common. But if we take an offset that's too small, we get this problem on the right, where our gradients represented by normals here um, will become uh, discontinuous, which we can see by this sort of grainy result if we zoom in. And because we're using this in optimization, this isn't really something we want. So we want to make sure it's smooth. So um, we have two, two goals. 
Um, so we, we still want an implicit function to build on top of our geometry, but we want it to be smooth, uh, like I said earlier, so, so it looks something like this. And we also want it to be an underestimate because uh, we've sort of accepted that the minimum distance might not be the best idea for constraints in optimization, but we need to make sure that it, it respects our original constraints too, because otherwise we can get results like we see here where this, this bunny and this plane pass through each other. And we don't, we don't want that for our simulations. So um, our, we're going to do this by trying to smooth out the minimum function and do it in, and underestimate it. So what we're gonna do essentially is we'll take this, uh, like we'll take this function on the left and we'll try and push all the isolines to the up, like up and to the right. And so um, we can do that actually through this so-called log sum x function, which I'll explain in a minute. And basically, as you can see, um, the sharp corners are smoothed out and our isolines are have been pushed up. But so that's a little tricky to see, but if you want to see a proof for this, uh, please see our paper. Um, so applying this distances, we'll get something like this. And here's the formula, I'll, I'll just walk through it now. So first we take exponentiated distances between our points. So um, we're gonna start off with, with just points for now. Um, so we're going to take an exponential distance with, and we have some accuracy parameter alpha, which I won't get into detail here in this talk. Um, and then we'll sum over all our entire mesh, and then we'll take a logarithm and scale. And this way, we essentially have a, a distance measure or a minimum distance measure that's that's been smoothed out. But while that works for points, it's not really clear how to extend this to edges and triangles. So we need to modify this formulation in some way. The first thing we might consider is that because we're working with points here, we, why don't we try? Um, why don't we just try converting our edges and triangles into points and sampling them? So that doesn't really work because we end up getting holes in our ISO surface and we don't get an underestimate. So you can see this by seeing multiple colors in this sort of capsule region, which would only capture the uh, smallest, um, like th this very first ISO region in, in white. And we can next try integrating, but again, that doesn't work. And in fact, we don't even see. Uh, the white ISO region here either. So this, this clearly does not work. And so what we're left with is we're going to actually use the exact distance to the edge. And, and so what that looks like is what we have here. So um, ignore this weight uh, function wi for now. I'll, I'll get into that in a second. But essentially this is what we have before, but we just compute a distance to our edge rather than you know, our, a point or integrating or something. So unfortunately though, this doesn't really quite work because now we get these sort of clumping artifacts if we don't, you know, um, if we just use this as is, because then um, like the distance, the closest point will be close to many, um, like on vertices that are shared between multiple edges, they will all have the same closest points and this will cause essentially this sort of clustering artifact. So to get around this, we're going to use these weight functions um, that look something like this, I won't get into, how these are formulated, it's a little technical, so please see the I'll please see the paper. But the basic idea is that we want, when the closest point is near a vertex in this mesh, we want it to have a small weight, and what's near the middle of an edge, we want it to have, an, have a high weight. So then what that looks like is something like on the right, where we've essentially re redistributed the mass and we have something that looks much more even. And we can do the same thing with triangles. Uh, again, I won't get into this, but the idea is largely the same. Um, so now we've talked about you know, how to extend this for different types of geometry, but we have a big problem still. This is very, very slow because we're summing over our entire mesh, which can potentially be huge. So for example, in large point clouds, they can go in the order of like millions or like tens or hundreds of millions of points. So this is really not something we want to deal with. So um, one thing we can do is consider the following case where we have a point, uh, like our query point in the bottom left and a bunch of, uh, a cluster of points in the top right. So not only are these quite far away from each other, the, each other, they're also in more or less the same position. So what we can do is approximate this by instead of computing the distance to each point individually, we can compute the distance to a single point and then take the exponential distance of that and multiply it by the number of points in that cluster. And this is uh, called the Barnes-Hot approximation. So uh, typically when this is used in, uh, applications, in, in applications like n-body simulations, we typically pick the center of mass but in our case, this doesn't really work because um, as you can see, um, one way of thinking about it is that we're moving all the points in our cluster to this purple point. But if we do that, then we're actually moving some of these, these orange points to be farther away than they were before. So we no longer have a conservative estimate or an underestimate of our distance. So this isn't really going to work. Instead, what we, what we can do is use the closest point to our query point as our approximation center or the purple point. And now if we do that, then as we can see, all our blue points are 
um, our, well, all our blue points move closer to our query point than they were before. So we only have an underestimate. And now let's get into results. Um, all the uh, results I showed at the beginning are actually done using our distance constraints. So here's another one. I can drop this ball onto this uh, slide made entirely of edges. And as we can see, it bounces along whenever it hits an edge and it's also rolling as well. Um, this is a bit of a long video, so I'm going to cut it short, I'm afraid. Um, so we also have, um, we can also do another example where we have this ring toss game made entirely of points. Now we have a trefoil knot made entirely of edges and we can throw it into this ring toss game and it will hit the edge and come to a stop. And, and notice that it did not pass through the points. And we also did not need to do surface reconstruction or anything on this, on this mesh. And lastly, we can even use that uh, city point cloud I showed at the beginning and run a motorcycle through it. So as you can see, it hits the own poles, it bounces along the cars and it eventually comes to a bit of a stop here. So uh, for future work, um, for context simulation, we've only really dealt with rigid bodies, but you can also extend this to deformables and add friction to it as well. But I think the more exciting application is to think of things other than contact where this can be used. Because in this talk, I haven't really gone into, I haven't described a system for physics, but I've described a system for dealing with differentiable distance constraints. And because this is such a fundamental quantity, I think this can be used in things like deep learning. So I'm actually very excited to see where this goes beyond just uh, contact simulation. Uh, thank you for listening. Thanks, Abhishek, for that uh, lovely talk. Remind me never to get on a motorcycle with you. Um, and we're gonna save. We're going to save uh, questions for the very end. We're gonna have a joint Q and A session and move on to our headline speaker now. Our headline speaker is a professor of mathematics at EPFL. She's an expert in using topology uh, to make decisions and predictions about complex biological structures found in neuroscience and cellular biology. It's really refreshing to see very similar problems that we might have, uh, that we might try to solve all the time in graphics and geometry processing and see how other fields talk about them. In this case, we're specifically talking about signal compression. So usually signal compression is one of the first go-tos when it comes to making computation go fast, right? It makes sense. A smaller signal is faster to process than a bigger signal. Um, and so that's all good and all, but the first thing you need to address if you want to use a smaller signal is how well does that compressed signal represent your full solution one, your full resolution one? After all, I can say anything is a compressed signal of something else. Maybe it's just not a good compression. Like maybe this finger is an elephant, but you still wouldn't be able to tell me the shape of the elephant, just, just that it represents an elephant for some application. And so these same types of problems, how to compress signals such that they remain a good representation of full-scale data, comes up again and again in countless fields. And today I'm excited to learn more about it from the perspective of bio biological cellular signal processing. Please welcome Professor Catherine Bellwald. Catherine Hess Bellwald. Thank you. Thank you very much. So it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation. So I realize that I'm not talking to topologists, so I'm going to try to explain any of the sort of algebraic topology or homological algebra that I use as I go along. And I hope you'll find it relevant to your interests as well. So um, the work I'm going to be talking about is actually by three of my PhD students, Kelly Mag, Celia Hacker, and Stefania Ebley, who actually wanted me to use this particular picture to illustrate them. And uh, so I'm going to be telling you about some recent this work that they've worked on and that I, it was a pleasure for me to, to guide them through. So let me introduce the subject. So the, I, there was a real need for new mathematical tools for doing two things. First of all, to generalize signal processing from graphs to simplicial complexes. So we just had a very nice talk in which the Abhishek was talking about meshes on things and simplicial complexes are just a, a sort of formalization, a combinatorial formalization of this notion of meshes beyond thinking about surfaces or three-dimensional objects. And you can be really interested in processing signals on these sorts of objects. And also, um, so graph neural networks are a really very popular new method in, in deep learning. And these have been generalized in particular by Stefania and her collaborators to a notion of simplicial neural networks. And if you want to do pooling in this sort of, uh, these sort of neural networks, you need to have uh, very special techniques. Even doing pooling methods for graph neural networks is something that's not particularly easy. And so what I'm gonna be talking about today can also be useful, we hope, for developing pooling methods for these simplicial neural networks. So 
I'm just going to recall the sort of formal definition of what a simplicial complex is and then draw some pictures. So if we start with some vertex set V, then a simplicial complex on that vertex set is just a collection of subsets of the vertex set. So P of V is the power set of V. Let me just get my pointer out here. Okay, so P of V is just the power set of V. And we're gonna have the conditions that if I take the singleton V, it's always going to be an element of my simplicial complex because that's one of my uh, vertex sets. And for every vertex here, and with an additional containment condition, a closure condition. So if I have a particular subset sigma and k, and tau is a subset of sigma, then tau is also in the simplicial complex k. This is a very formal definition. And then what we write k of n for the collection of all subsets that contain exactly n plus one elements, we'll call those the n simplices. The motivation, the geometric motivation for the name coming from the fact that if you have a subset with one element, then it's sort of like a zero dimensional thing. And if you have a set of two elements, you can think of it as sort of a two dimensional thing, as we'll see on the next slide, which is an illustration of a simplicial complex. So in this case, we have a vertex set with five vertices, V0, V1, V2, V3, and V4. And so the sort of geometric representation we're making of the simplicial complex is to say that, okay, we assign a point, and these points should all be. Um, uh, finally distributed that two points in the plane. And then we'll say that the existence of a segment joining two points tells us that the subset, for example, the subset V0, V1, the subset V1, V2, and so on, those are all in my simplicial complex. And when I fill in a triangle like this, it means that the subset V1, V2, V3 is also an element of the simplicial complex. So this is People very often write simplicial complexes in this sort of more geometric way, but this is an example. And I included in particular an example like this to say, just because I have the three edges doesn't mean I necessarily fill it in. So having all of these particular subsets doesn't mean that their union is also in the simplicial complex. But on the other hand, if I do have their union in the simplicial complex, then every one of the faces is also in that. So this is the notion of a simplicial complex. And these are objects that Algebraic topologists, combinatorial topologists study a lot because many topological spaces can be approximated combinatorially by such simplicial complexes. So now what we want to do is translate this sort of combinatorial topological world into an algebraic world. And there the crucial notion is that of a chain complex. So I'm going to talk here about a very special case of chain complexes when we're looking at chain complexes of real vector spaces, so vector spaces over the reals. And so what that consists of is a bunch of real vector spaces, one for each natural number, together with linear maps, linear transformations between these vector spaces, with the condition that if I look at the composite of any two like this, the composite should be zero. So this is what we call a chain complex of real vector spaces. Okay. Now, the notation that I'll use to indicate this whole structure instead of writing down every single time I do it, you know, something big like this, I'll say it's C together with this del, which is what we call the differential in the chain complex, or maybe sometimes I'll even be more lazy and just write C. And if I have a vector in the vector space Cn, then it's what I call an n chain, it's the language that's used, of this particular chain complex. And when you, because you know that you have this particular equality that holds. What that means is that the image of this particular linear transformation is in the kernel of this one. And you can ask yourself, well, how, what's the difference? You know, how big is the difference between the image of this one and the kernel of this one? And so that's where we calculate what we call the homology, the nth homology of the chain complex. So this is the homology. The enthomology of the chain complex is measuring the difference between the kernel of this one and the image of this one. So it tells you how close it is to being what we call an exact sequence. And when you compute the homology of your chain complex, it's a really important invariant of the chain complex. Now, if you want to compare two chain complexes, the way you compare them is via what's called a chain map. So a chain map, which we'll denote like this, is just a collection of linear transformations like this between the different vector spaces of which is composed. And where the condition that you have is that if I compute the differential and then use this linear map, 
I get the same result as if I computed the, the did the linear map and then did the differentials. So the two different ways of going from here to here have to be the same. So when this collection of linear maps satisfies that condition, we call it a chain map. And what's nice about chain maps is that they're going to induce then homomorphisms or linear maps on those homology groups by taking the equivalence class here. So recall that this was the kernel of this quotiented by this. So the elements here are all equivalence classes. It takes an element of the homology here to the corresponding element of the homology here you get by applying Fn. So I start with an element here, I apply Fn and I end up here. And it turns out this is well-defined. So this gives us a way of saying, if I start with a chain map, which is a way of comparing two chain, chain complexes, it gives me a way of then getting an induced natural, a linear transformation on each of these homology groups. And that's an important thing to be able to do. Okay, well, I started with simplicial complexes and then I said, well, we're gonna move this into an algebraic world. So let me explain how we go from simplicial complexes to chain complexes. So we start with only simplicial complexes. So some set of subsets of a set of vertices. And let me put an ordering, any ordering, any total ordering on the vertex set. And then this, uh, the chain complex I'm going to associate to this special complex is built up as follows. The nth vector space I'm going to get is just going to be the R span of the n simplices. So all possible linear combinations of the n simplices. These are going to be my basis elements. And then how do I define this uh, and differential? So this is supposed to go deep n from cnk to cn minus 1k, then it's going to take a basis element, which is an n simplex, so it's an ordered set of n plus 1 vertices, and take it to the alternating sum of the n minus 1 simplices you get by removing one of the vertices at a time. So just looking at all the faces and taking the alternating sum of the faces. And that actually makes sense because we're looking at this as this is a sum of basis elements in cn minus 1k. And this actually, it's an easy exercise to show that if you, this really does give you a chain complex, if you compose dn with dn plus one, it is going to be zero. And so this gives you a chain complex and from that you can compute homology, which gives you, which is an important invariant of the simplicial complex. And it's doing something where you could think of as counting the number of n-dimensional holes in your simplicial complex. So if I computed, for example, uh, h1 of, you know, the chain complex that's associated with the special complex, and I look at its dimension, that this is really the, the number of, let's call it empty loops or empty cycles in, in the same complex. So it's measuring something very geometric when you look at this dimension. Okay, so here's the notation I'll use for the chain complex associated to the special complex. And now we're about ready to start talking about the, what we can think of as being signals on some partial complexes. So informally, what are we talking about? So here we have a simplicial complex with a certain number of vertices and edges and two simplices and so on. And a signal on the two simplices of the simplicial complex is just a way of associating a real number to each one of these two simplices. So each one of these SIs is just going to be a real number. Now, the reason we're moving now from the, the, uh, the combinatorial world to the algebraic world is that there's actually a nice formal way of thinking about what we mean by a signal on the two simplices as being, in fact, just an element of the, of the end to being an end chain. Because what is an end chain? An end chain here is just a linear combination of the end simplices. In other words, we have associated some real number, which is the coefficient, to each of the end simplices. And that's what we're going to think of as a signal. It's just an element of this nth chain group. So I'll just recall here that this, remember, is the R span of the n synthesis. OK? So this is how, this is why it makes sense to move into this algebraic world in this context. When you think about this. OK? So now, the question we want to study is a question of compression or sparsification. If you have a signal, if your simplicial complex is particularly big, you have a lot of vertices, you have a lot of edges, a lot of two simplices, and so on. If you have some signal which is non-zero over a very large number of simplices, doing any computations is quite difficult. You'd like to be able to compress it so that it's supported on a much smaller number of simplices. 
And that's the way in which you would like to compress this or sparsify this. And so, but you, when you do it, you don't want to be losing too much. You want your compression actually to retain a lot of the information and also to respect the, the topology, the, the real structure of your simplicial complex. So that's the question we want to try to answer, the question that was motivating these three PhD students. So their approach used two complementary tools, one of which is called algebraic discrete Morse theory. I'm going to give you a brief introduction to that. And the other is discrete Hodge theory. So these are both discrete analogs of well-known theories that are coming from thinking about smooth manifolds. And what they get from this is an algorithm that really gives you really good compression of a given signal on a simplicial complex. And the reason why this is sort of reasonable to think about is that discrete Morse theory is well known for being useful of, for compression, because basically it's, it's taking a large chain complex and finding a way to compress it nicely to a smaller chain complex. On the other hand, Hodge theory in, is well known for being useful in signals, and in particular, discrete Hodge theory has already been used for studying signals, for example, on graphs and so on. But now you they found a really creative way of putting these two pieces together in order to come up with this algorithm for compression. So I'm going to start by telling you now a bit about this algebraic discrete Morse theory. Okay, so we need a bit more, a uh, couple more notions from sort of homological algebra. The first one is the notion of a deformation retracted chain complexes. Now, if you're taking a basic course in topology, you know probably about the notion of a deformation retract. The idea, for example, of if you take, let me draw something here, if I take a disk minus a point, let's see, that didn't come up very well, but anyway, a disk minus a point, then if you have a disk, you punch a hole in it, you can sort of push all of the matter of the disk back to the edge, and the circle sort of sitting inside this disk, this punctured disk, I mean, it illustrates the puncture a bit better. So there we have a punctured disk. Then you have this inclusion of the circle into the punctured disk, and then you can actually retract this punctured disk back onto the circle. And the circle is a deformation retract of this punctured disk. Well, what I'm talking about here is an algebraic analog of this notion, the notion of a deformation retract of chain complexes. And so the idea here is so here we have a big chain complex, here we have a smaller chain complex. Here we have some sort of injective map from the big, the small one into the big one, and some sort of retraction from the big one onto the small one. So thinking about this analogy here. So the idea is that this composite should be equal to the identity on the small complex. And then if we do the composite in the other direction, well, you're unlikely to get the identity, right? Because this one is small and this one is big. But what you get is at least homotopic to the identity. So this is saying here that there's a, what we call a chain homotopy between the identity on C and this composite here. So, What's nice about this situation is that in this case, both of these chain maps here, so both the chain maps, they go, chain maps always induce homomorphisms on homology, and in this case, they're actually going to induce isomorphisms. So this deformation retract is going to retain a lot of the important structure of your chain complex. And so that's, it's a, a very strong way of saying that you're going to get these isomorphisms. So that you respect the essential topological structure or homological structure of these chain complexes. So that's the first key notion that we need. And another point that we can make here another, is that when you're in the situation where you have this deformation retract, then this big complex splits very nicely into two pieces, one of which is the image of this injective map here, and one of which is the kernel of this surjective map row. And what's really nice about this is that this part is actually what we call acyclic, meaning that the homology of this thing is actually zero. So it's only, it's only this piece here that is going to contribute to the, to the homology. Yes, we have a lot, we have, so that means that even in this case, we have this very big complex, a very small complex, somehow we know what the important part is. Okay. All right, so now, there's one more notion that we need, which is to take a chain complex and choose what we call a base for it. So it's not saying we're choosing a basis for, in particular necessarily for each complex, but we're each for each complex, each sorry, each vector space that's in this complex. This is the nth vector space, the space of n chains. We have some decomposition of it as a direct sum of subspaces. 
And we have some index set i n, and it's for each m. So we have a way of just taking some sort of subspace decomposition. It could be a trivial decomposition where every piece would be this, or we could have chosen some basis, and then we would have all of these would be just one dimensional or something like that. So in this case, we saw we call i n the set of n cells of this base chain complex. And in this context, we can consider interesting restrictions of the differential in the chain complex. So if I have some alpha, so that means that C alpha is some uh, subspace of Cn, and some beta in In minus 1, so C beta is some subspace of Cn minus 1, we can consider the following composite, where we look first at the inclusion of C alpha into Cn as a subthing. We compute the differential, and then we project down onto C beta. This composite, we're going to call it del beta alpha. So it's looking at sort of we have a sort of matrix representation of this differential here in terms of different components, like this. Okay, so what are we going to do with this notion of a base chain complex? Well, let me first give you an example, going back to our simplicial complexes. So we can think of, we have this the chain complex is associated to the simplicial complex, and I can give it a base, which is just K itself, in the sense that I have a decomposition if I look at the nth chain complex. So recall that this is the span over R, the reals, of Kn. Another way of saying that is that I can write that as a direct sum of spans of the n simplices, like this. So it gives me a very nice decomposition of this sort. And so I can look at K itself as being a base of this. So this is what I worked out. Okay, so that's an important motivating example. And it's really the only, if you don't like the, to think about the more general case, you can just think about this specific case as a way of saying, I've chosen a specific basis for each of these guys given by sort of the obvious basis given by the n synthesis. Okay, now to each base complex like this, I can associate a directed graph. So a directed graph is going to have vertex set. So are going to be my vertices. The vertices will be particularly the, all of these n cells, and I'm going to have an edge. So these are my edges, directed edges. I'm going to have an edge from alpha to beta any time that I have alpha, which is an i n, and beta, which is i n minus 1, as long as this composite differential, which goes from C alpha to C beta, is non-zero. So this is just a way of associating a directed graph to one of these base complexes. And if I choose some subset of edges, I could say, well, I'd like to reverse some of these edges. And I'll use this notation for saying I start with this graph, but I reverse some subset of these edges. Now I'm going to give you a very specific example in just a moment of what this thing looks like. But before I do that, now that we have this notion of the graph associated to a base complex and what you can get by reversing the edges in this set, the crucial notion is that of an algebraic Morse matching. So this is an algebraic generalization of the notion of a Morse function on a manifold. So I don't have time to talk about Morse functions on manifolds. We're just going to see the algebraic version today. So it's going to be some set of edges, M, in this graph, which satisfies three conditions, which is that, first of all, each cell, each vertex in the graph is adjacent to at most one edge. So we have a, uh, an edge, we have a vertex in the graph, and at most one edge associated to that vertex, either as the source or the sink, is there. Second, that all of these pieces, the components of the differential, are actually isomorphisms for the edges in M, because we're going to want to invert them, and so that's why we want to consider ones that are only isomorphisms. And finally, that in the graph that we get, by inverting all the edges in M, there are no directed cycles. So this is an acyclicity condition that turns out to be necessary for the definition to be reasonable. Okay, so let's see an example. Ah, sorry, still one more step. Then there's a the notion of the critical cells that are associated to one of these algebraic Morse matching. So suppose I have one of these base complexes, so a chain complex, a base, and a Morse matching. So a set of edges satisfying those three conditions I just mentioned. Then they have what they call the critical cells, so these are going to be those vertices that are adjacent to no edge in M. So I look at the edges in M, and they look, okay, which vertices are not associated to any edge in M? And those are what we call the critical cells. All right, so let's do an example. 
So here's an example of a very simple uh, simplicial complex. It's just a two simplex. So we have its three vertices, its three edges, and the one two simplex. And so we can associate to that a chain complex in the way that I described and give a base, which is K itself. So if I look at the associated graph to that, then I have one vertex for each cell. And I have an edge from one cell to another, basically where the, when this one is a face of this one. So I have, for example, here, this particular two simplex, it has its three faces, and that gives me the three arrows like this. So this is actually, uh, in this particular context, has, it goes, has another name, it's called the Hasse diagram of the simplicial complex. But it's this particular example of this, of this uh, construction that I was talking about. So now what does a Morse matching look like in this context? So here's an example of a Morse matching, matching an edge to a two simplex, matching a zero simplex to a one simplex like this. And if you look what that translates to in terms of this graph, then that would mean that previously I had an edge going from V0, V1 to V0, but now I'm just going to reverse it because I put this in my Morse matching. Similarly, I'm going to reverse the edge that I had here, getting one going from V1, V2 to the two simplex like this. Okay, so more snatching, we see that that doesn't create any direct cycles or anything. And then I look at which vertices are not adjacent to any edge in the more snatching, and those are my critical cells, like this. And somehow if you look at what's left when you retain only the critical cells in your story, then it's sort of like condensing the whole structure to its essential pieces without and maintaining the same topological information. Okay. So the fundamental theorem of algebraic discrete Morse theory is due to, I'll first say it in Swedish, Emil Hördberg. So Emil Skördberg, who proved this, it was about 10, 15 years ago. So you have a, a Morse matching on a chain complex. Then it turns out that there is one of these deformation retracts I talked about that is just collapsing this big complex to a much smaller one, because what you're doing now is restricting to only the critical cells. You're getting rid of all of the cells that are not critical, and you're just keeping those pieces. So this, if you choose your Morse matching well, you won't have too many critical cells, and you'll have a much, much smaller complex. In addition to which, this is not just an existence result. It's a constructive result. You have very explicit formulas for all of these things. So you can really write down exactly what these maps are doing and how they're defined. So you have the advantage of you really compressing things a lot and you know exactly how it's happening. Okay, so now we're gonna see how we can take sort of arbitrary deformation retracts and see them as coming from more snatchings using Hodge theory. So we just saw that these Morse retractions of the site I just defined are particularly nice. We have these nice explicit formulas and so on. So when does a deformation retract actually come from such a Morse matching? And it turns out that this discrete Hodge theory is going to give us a way to do this. So let me tell you about discrete Hodge theory. So we're still going to be talking about chain complexes, but I'm going to put a couple more conditions on them. They're going to be what I call finite type, which means in every degree, each of these CNs are just finite dimensional vector spaces. This is what we get in real life anyway, so it's not really a problem. And I want, in addition, not just vector spaces, but they should have an inner product. We're going to get some geometry going here. All right, so we have real inner product spaces. And once you have an inner product, then anytime you have a linear map like this, you know how to take its adjoint. And we're gonna work with both the differential and its adjoint in this context of discrete Hodge theory. So what are we gonna do? So we have this, when it's still in a situation, finite type chain complex of real inner product spaces. And here we have, I'm going to look at three consecutive vector spaces in the chain complex and the associated differentials and their associated adjoints. Out of this construction, I get two different endomorphisms of Cn, one of which says I take the adjoint of dn plus one and I come back by del n plus one, or I could apply the differential and come back with the adjoint. This gives me, as I said, two different endomorphisms of the subject, one of which is called the up Laplacian and the other is called a down Laplacian. And there's a good reason for calling this Laplacian. It really 
behaves in a similar way to what we think of as for the Laplacian that we see in analysis. And what one then studies is usually the sum of the up and the down Laplacian, which is called the combinatorial Laplacian. So it's some map we get from Cn to itself. And now that we have this operator on Cn, we can start to apply operator theory, spectral theory, and so on, to study what's going on with this operator. And doing that gives us plenty of interesting information. So let's think about how we can figure fit spectral theory into this. So on the one hand, for Cn, we have, we can go down with the differential and come back with the adjoint, and that gives us the down Laplacian on here. Or we can, from Cn minus 1, we can go up with this adjoint and come back with dn, and that gives us the up Laplacian on dn plus 1. And spectral theory tells you that the spectrum or the collection of eigenvalues of this operator on Cn and this operator on Cn minus 1 are the same. So let's call that spec n. So this is the set of eigenvalues of this one and of this one. And spectral theory also tells us that for every non-zero eigenvalue, you can find orthonormal bases of the eigens, the lambda eigenspace of this operator and the lambda eigenspace of this operator. They're actually in bijective correspondence via very explicit bijection, which is just multiplying by one over the square root of the eigenvalue times your operator del n. And this gives you a very explicit bijection between these two orthonormal bases. So the spectral theory is really powerful in this context. And this bijection is going to turn out to be really important for what we want to do in order to find a Morse matching. OK. So the fundamental theorem of discrete Hodge theory goes back to Ekman, which is a very long time ago, back in the 50s or something. And so we're again in the situation where this guy is a finite type chain complex of real inner product spaces. And it turns out that the nth homology of this complex is nothing but the kernel of the Laplacian. So this is the, a discrete analog of a well-known result for, um, for Dirac homology, for example. And so this is the really nice to be able to say, OK, Here's a, way, a very explicit way I can compute this homology. I defined it originally as the kernel. Recall it's like the kernel of del n quotient by the image of del n plus 1. Well, it turns out that that's exactly just the kernel of this, of this Laplacian. And then, in fact, using the spectral theory, you can say, well, this Cn, the nth uh, vector space in this chain complex, breaks up in three pieces like this. So there's the part that is the kernel of delta n, and then there's other two parts. And if we think about what information is sort of contained in these other three parts, these are what are sort of harmonic type pieces. These ones are gradient-like. So they're coming up from Cn minus 1. You're taking some sort of gradient of something in Cn minus 1. And these are curl-like. It's like you're taking the curl. You're looking at sort of the cyclicity of something in Cn plus 1. So you really see sort of three geometric type pieces coming out in this decomposition this Hodge decomposition of Cn. And now let's sort of try to move towards the, the Morse theory here. So recall that this one here has an orthonormal basis of, which is given by eigenvectors of the up Laplacian. And so we know that that's going to be given by some union of these bases that I talked about before. And this one is going to have an orthonormal basis of eigenvectors from the down Laplacian, which looks like this. And this is going to, in the bijection that we had before between these, these uh, orthonormal bases are going to help us define the Morse match. So this is what we're going to call the Hodge basis. So now we have, again, the same conditions on this chain complex. And I'm going to define a very particular base of this guy. So I'm going to take the union of all of these um, B lambdas and B lambda minuses for the different the these different sets of eigenvalues. And then I'm going to choose, in that degree, some basis for the kernel of delta n. OK? And then it turns out, using this basis, I can, uh, it's, a, it's a particularly nice basis for this chain complex, and it's going to enable us to define sort of a canonical Morse matching in this context. So this is what we're going to call the Hodge matching. So we have this now base term complex. 
And we're going to find a particular Morse matching on there by saying, I'm going to look at all of the axes that are coming from one of these uh, orthonormal bases. And recall that I have this isomorphism bijection given by one over the square root of lambda del n, which is going from this b lambda minus to b lambda plus. And that's exactly this isomorphism that we're going to use in order to decide which edges we want to invert. Okay. And it turns out that this matching is actually really a Morse matching. And therefore, by the, the fundamental theorem of algebraic discrete Morse theory, gives us a really nice associated deformation retract, which is really simple, because at the end you have a chain complex with a zero differential. And this is just going to be some sort of inclusion. It's a beautifully simple deformation retract, which we call the Hodge retraction. Now recall that when we have a deformation retractive chain complexes, we know that the homology of the big one is isomorphic to the homology of the small one, which means that we can deduce from this Ekman's original result because this tells us the homology of this, the homology of C, is isomorphic to the homology of this guy, but this one has a zero differential, so the homology of this one is just the kernel of the Laplacian. So that this is a sort of a rigidified version of, of Ekman's results. This was by the, my three PhD students, this. Very pretty to put the pieces together this way. So here's an example of what you could do in this context. So here we have another simplicial complex with four vertices. Now we have uh, n one two simplex like this. And here's just sort of an arbitrary matching you could get on the associated graph. So here we're just taking it as a, as a base. We were taking just the the uh, standard base, which is given by the vertices, the simplices themselves. And as you can, you know, it's kind of a, a mess, one might say. But if you use the Hodge basis and use the Hodge matching, then you have this very beautiful way of straightening things out and lining them up. And so you see that the pieces that are really left, once you get rid of all the ones that are matched, are exactly the pieces giving you the homology. So this matching just sort of cleans up everything in this pulls out the essential information. Okay. So then the question was, okay, if I have an arbitrary deformation retract, how far is it from being one of these very beautiful Hodge retractions? Where, okay, so for, in order to be able to talk about this all, we need to have the sort of inner product structure here. So let's assume that we have that inner product structure. And what we can do then is say, well, let's look at the particular subspace of C, which is the kernel of, your, of the row in my retraction. And because there's an induced inner product in here, I can do the Hodge matching on this one and then extend it trivially to the whole complex. That is to say, I take the Hodge matching and I, then I don't include any other edges. If I do that, then it turns out that the original deformation retract that I had is actually equivalent to a much simpler deformation retract where, okay, I don't have something with different, uh, zero differential, but something much simpler. I just have the image of Yoda. I know that that's sort of the only important piece of the homology and so on. And it turns out that there's, you know, I can basically replace the arbitrary deformation retract by one of these very nice sort of morsified deformation retracts up to isomorphism. The advantage being that, again, because this is coming from this fundamental theorem of algebraic discrete Morse theory, I have explicit formulas for these maps here. So I can really track what's going on. OK. So what does this have to do with compression and reconstruction of signals? So if I'm given a deformation retract and some sort of signal over here, now the idea here, again, as I said, this is our big complex. This is a small complex. I'd like to take the signals and compress it to the smaller thing. But then I'd like to be able to reconstruct it as well. So I start with some signal here. I'm going to move it down there and then see what happens when I bring it back. How far is the new guy from what I started with? So I think of this as compression and this is reconstruction. So Kelly and Stefani and Sandler decided to focus on particular kinds of matching they called n, n minus one free. So when you have a matching like this, a Morse matching, that means that you are no edges with a source that's in I n and a target that's in I n minus one. So what does this look like? So here I have two times the same simplicial complex. 
And here is a matching that is one zero free. There are no matchings going from a zero simplex to one simplex. They all go from a one simplex to a two simplex. This one is two one free. There are no uh, edges going from one to two. They're only going from zero to one. So this is that you're just making that kind of a restriction. You at least avoid those kinds of matchings. And if you do that, you can both sparsify and compress. So if you're in a situation where you've chosen a base so that your direct sum decompositions of your chain complex are actually orthogonal decompositions with respect to your inner product, then it turns out that you get uh, sparsification. So you look at the associated Morse matching, and then you say, I start with a signal here. I compress it. I reconstruct it. Then it turns out that that compressed reconstructed signal is supported only on the critical cells. So if you have very few critical cells, then your compressed signal is supported on only very few simplices. So this can be useful to know for sparsification purposes. Then we can try to think about what happens with reconstruction. And for this, I just want to recall a general result about adjoint decompositions. So again, in the situation where we have our chain complex of finite dimensional real inner product spaces, and I'm looking at the adjoints of the differentials. And because of you know, the general theory of orthogonal decompositions, I can write this as a direct sum of the kernel of this plus the image of this, or the image of this one plus the direct sum of the kernel of this one. So these two decompositions are very useful when you're trying to understand the structure of this. So they proved the following reconstruction theorem, which says, OK, start with a Morse matching on a complex like this, where we have the usual you know, existence of, a real, of an inner product. We look at the associated deformation retract coming from the fundamental theorem of algebraic discrete Morse theory. And then it turns out that there is no error in this reconstruction on the part that is the kernel of del n plus 1, as long as the matching we've chosen is n and minus one free. So it means the error is concentrated uniquely on one of the components of this decomposition. So, and there's a dual version of this as well, which, of which I will spare you the details today. So here's an example. Here's an example of a one zero free Morse matching. So the only matchings we have are going from one simplicity to two simplicities. And the idea is the following. So I start with some signal on the, one simplicity, so a one chain. So here it's represented by a color code on the edges of this simplicial complex. The color code telling you the values of the signal on the different edges. Then for this particular, this particular Morse matching, we look at what we get when we compress. So once we compress, then these two parts have disappeared. This is my simplicial complex, and I get a compressed signal like this. And then I reconstruct it again. I come back to the original complex. And I want to say, how big is the difference between this one and what I started with? And where does that this difference live? So here's the reconstruction again. What they did was then compute the projections of the signal onto these different components. And what you see is that on the part of the signal that is the kernel of the adjoint of del2, everything matches perfectly. And then there is some error on the image of del2. Okay, it's not too big, but there is some, some error. So here the green is the projection of the original, and the orange is the projection of this one onto these various components. Okay, so this is an illustration of that reconstruction theorem. So just a few words about actual algorithms and computations, find some examples. So there, the problem I wanted to solve is, is the following. We start with a signal, uh, N chain, and we want to find, choose a matching that is minimizing this loss. Where here we're taking the norm with respect to the inner product. So here we're assuming we have an inner product in each of these, and we're taking the norm with respect to that inner product. But at the same time, for compression reasons, we also want to minimize as much as we can the total dimension of the chain complex we're looking at. So how can we go about that? Well, in general, this is a very hard problem, not to say NP complete. But their idea was to say, let's work sequentially. Let's keep it easy. And in each just do a number of steps, in each step, we do one of these n plus one n pairings and do it in a way that we minimize the loss at each step of the process. So they wrote algorithms to, like, in each step, minimize the loss and then to, to chain them together. And so when you do this, you can do the following. So here's another example of a chain complex 
with a signal on the edges, where the signal, the value of the signal is again given by this color code. And you can apply the retraction to it and then include it back. Look at where the reconstruction error is and then project this again onto the Hodge basis. Again, you see, as, as we were promised by the reconstruction theorem, everything matches perfectly there and we have some error there. So this is the kind of process we're gonna do. Here, the, the signal that you were given was actually the height with respect to uh, measured along this direction. And you can say, okay, well, that's, one way we could do this sort of slowly eliminating edges and, uh, and doing some iterative process like that. How good is this process? So what they did was to say, well, suppose that instead of optimizing the choice of, uh, at each stage to minimize the loss, what if we just sort of randomly chose some um, matching to do? What would happen if we iterated the steps? And so they looked at signals that were taken on that same simpatial complex I just showed you. It is sampled from uniform distribution given by height, which is the example I just showed you, sampled from a normal distribution or given by distance from the center of the simpatial complex. And they either optimized the choice of the matching made at each stage uh, to minimize the loss or did a random thing. And clearly it was a good idea to minimize the loss at each stage, that the, the total loss over time increases much less rapidly when you make this optimal choice at each stage. The point is that if you try to do it all at once, this is actually an NP-complete problem, I believe, to try to choose the appropriate Morse matching. So to summarize, what they showed was that chain complexes of finite dimensional real inner product spaces give you this canonical Hodge Morse mappings, matchings, which are very beautiful. And that if you have any deformation rejected chain complexes, which have this additional real inner product structure, that it's going to be in a strong sense canonically equivalent to a Morse retraction where we actually have explicit formulas for all of the chain maps we're considering. That the reconstruction of an n-chain signal that we compress by a particular kind of matching is supported on the critical cells, which is a very nice sparsification result. And that we master where the reconstruction loss of the n-chain signal is, the where it is supported. Finally, that if they do this sequential collapse algorithm, optimizing each step, so minimizing the loss in each step, that this performs much better than random sequences of pairings. So that was the story I wanted to tell you today. Thank you very much for your attention, and I look forward to answering questions later Thank on. You. Thank you, Professor, Thank you. for uh, that very informative talk. I know I'm going to come back to this uh, whenever I'm going to take a topology course in the future and think about all the things you've described here again. Uh, we're going to start with our Q&A session, and we're going to start with some questions for Abhishek, just so that we can give uh, Catherine a chance to take a break and relax for, for a second. Shall uh, I stop sharing my screen? Oh, okay. yes, please. With that, uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, Abhishek? Oh, here you are. Okay. Um, so your method is can do collisions on points, edges, and triangles. Um, well, triangle soups, triangle meshes. How would you compare the pros and cons between your method on triangle meshes versus traditional uh, collision detection techniques for triangle meshes? Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so in my method, um, basically, like, so for example, like in like, you know, traditional methods or simpler methods, like using like a Gauss, projected gauss seidel solver, you would like be able to deal with individual constraints one by one and project them or like, um, there are like met more recent methods like with incremental potential contact where you know they have like a finite supported uh, barrier function. So I think um, in those cases, like just because of like the sort of trade offs we make in terms of making like conservative estimates and stuff, it's not necessarily the best approach for those, but it does provide like a unified approach in the sense that it can support other things that those other methods don't do well, like supporting like points and uh, edges. But yeah, just for triangles alone, it's not necessarily better than pre-existing methods. Okay, thank you. And um, just to follow up, for point cloud data, let's say, would if your user has access to a, to additional information like normals or um, I don't know some other thing that's at at each point, um, is it easy to incorporate that information in your collision in your collision detection algorithm or in your uh, distance field approximation would that would that sort of information help uh, that's a great question i actually haven't thought of that so 
right now, um, just plugging them into log some X, that's, uh, it uses unoriented points. But I think it might be possible to at least, like, for example, like incorporate normals to try and like match gradients of the implicit function. But uh, again, I haven't really thought about this too much. It's definitely an interesting direction to go in. Okay. Thank you. Um, question, I have a question for Catherine now. Let me just uh, think about which one I want to ask because there's a few. Um, so you briefly mentioned that there's a Morse theory for manifolds and we wonder whether the theories you've mentioned are generalizable to discrete simplicial surfaces. Like in our case, we in graphics, we deal a lot with triangle meshes, uh, just tri mm -hmm. interconnected triangles. Um, do they are do these theories usually uh, consider manifolds with analytic expressions like a sphere or something? So, so you're asking, sorry, so you're asking whether this this generalizes to uh, to simplicial. I mean, it is it is all simplicial. It's all combinatorial. So, okay. so it should be very yeah. easy to plug this absolutely to no. any. So in any absolutely sort of no no it should go no no it's a, this is meshes are a particular example of. Mm -hmm. Simplicial complexes. So yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And so, well, um, just one more question. I we could we. I I just have some more questions about what sort of signals this method is very well suited for representing, and it, it, if there is there such a signal that it can't handle very well, uh, it, that it can't compress very well on a simpl on a on a, a simplex. It, like, I don't know how much you you guys have thought about I don't know such specific applications like a like a heat signature or something like that. Well, so in the the last thing, the last example I showed where we were looking at comparing making these optimal choices at each stage with making random choices at each step, we were looking at four very different kinds of signals on the same simplicial complex, right? One which is uniform distribution, height, distance from the center, and the other one was, I don't remember what, but in any case, uh, I think we haven't yet found a signal that was harder to treat than another kind of, kind of signal. And another thing that um, I did not have time to talk about today because it, go, and it requires sort of more, somewhat more complex machinery is you can also use signals that are not just real numbers. You could have vector valued signals, you could have collections of signals. So there are, there are ways of generalizing this that can be really interesting as well, beyond just thinking about real valued signals. So. I see. Thank you. And uh, we, we wonder how your sparsification method compares to other graph sparsification methods used in the machine learning community. For example, those based on spectral clustering or greedily removing edges. Um, so I don't I don't know. That's a really good question. Uh, I don't think that uh, Kelly Celia and Stefania have done those sorts of comparisons yet. It was really just um, I think one of the things that's nice about this particular sparsification is that it's um, it's canonical in some sense. You're not making any choices, right? It's sort of yeah. given to you by. <clears throat> so it would be interesting to do a comparison for sure. In, in that context but mm -hmm. i mean the the point as well is that if you if you manage to make a clever uh choice of a morse matching so that you're left with very few critical cells then then you're going to have a really good sparsification so and one thing they showed is that um if you look at the algorithm they have for doing this iterated um doing these iterated matchings that they know towards what it converges and that really, in the end, there's there they convert, compress it just about as far down as you possibly could. There's not that much left after they if you go all the way through the process. Mm -hmm. And so, my guess would be that it should compare quite favorably with other methods for signal compression on graphs or on well, there aren't other methods of signal compression on simplicial complexes that I'm aware of. So I think that this should be um, it should be uh, quite competitive in that sense. Thank you. Um, we have one more question for Abhishek um, from Sylvia. Actually, so this is about this is about the blobs you get, you show in Poisson surface recon in your Poisson surface reconstruction examples. Um, she says that some blobs can be hard to look at, but they serve a purpose. Uh, it's Poisson surface reconstruction's best guess for how to complete the shape in question. So 
if I were only using the point cloud, if I were only using a point cloud and had occlusions, objects can go through the occlusion, which would be closed, which would be closed by Poisson surface reconstruction, right? How could we like how could we handle occlusions in uh, this point cloud framework? Mm, that's mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure I entirely understand. So it was a question about like you have like missing data in your point cloud essentially through like maybe like occlusions in the scanning process. Okay, I see Sylvia nodding. Uh, yeah, that's that's an interesting question. So I think um, at least in this framework, we don't um, like we use the points that are given. So I think like in the cases I've shown, like you might have, you know, sort of uncertainty at like sort of the edges of the point cloud, like, you know, at the edges of the scan, you don't really have much. And typically with these sort of larger scans, I think these larger scale scans, you don't really have any occlusions because they typically, you know, scan from multiple angles. But I think, yeah, like the sort of iPhone examples, I think I didn't spend a whole lot of time on this, but if you see like there's like, there are definitely occlusions if you move around and you like view it from different angles. So yeah, I think um, at least from my perspective, I think like, um, I, I think, it would be more of a question of like, you know, scanning from different angles, but I think also like for more straightforward occlusions, like, you know, there's, you know, you can sort of straightforwardly interpolate the surface from like the side. I think uh, using logs and eyes could actually deal with that because then it will try and cluster the those exosurfaces surfaces together. So you can still, you know, sort of get decent results there, but it isn't really something I've considered. And it's definitely like an interesting idea or uh, thing to look at. You. Thank you very much. Um, I think that's all the time we have for today. So I'd like to thank both of our speakers for their great talks. Uh, so thank you for joining us. Um, and so we're going to see you guys again, not next week, but the week after that. We're taking a little bit of a break for the SIGGRAPH Asia deadline. Um, and so we'd like to thank our artist for this week. This is an, a poster done by Pete Ryan. Um, apart from that, everybody have a good rest of your day uh, or a good night if you're in Switzerland. And thank you for joining us. Bye.